So I'm excited for today, though. Um, I have a message that I, I just titled, Three Questions Everyone Asks. Three Questions Everyone Asks. Asks. Well, a few weeks ago, though, my wife and I, Mandy and I, we were on a trip and we were staying in a hotel. And I was laying in bed that night in the hotel room after I put the big curtains closed. And I was laying there and I just think weird thoughts at night. Anybody else? Just like, you're just like trying to solve all the world's problems, think about weird, abstractive conspiracy theories, all these kinds of things. But that night, here's what I was thinking about I was thinking about hotel rooms are dark. It was really deep, it was a really deep moment. But I'm willing to, I, I gotta say, there is no darkness at the level of hotel room darkness. We can't get our room at home as dark as hotel room darkness. When you get both of those layers of curtains, you shut both of those. I even put like a t-shirt or something over the alarm clock or I unplug it. I want like no light. And it is like dark, dark, dark. But there's a problem with hotel room darkness is when you get to be about 40 years old or a little bit old, older, you have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, every night. And so ho hotel room darkness, you're not used to your own room. In my own room, I get out of bed, and I'm like, one, two, three steps to the end of the bed. One, two, three, four, you know, that kind of thing. I can make my way to the bathroom, but in a hotel room, I wake up sometimes if I'm on a trip or in a hotel room, I don't know what planet I'm on in the middle of the night. I'm, I don't even know if Mandy's in bed next to me. I'm like, Mandy, are you here? Am I alone on this trip or are you here? I don't know what side of the bed I'm on. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? You have no idea what's going on. And so if you have to get up in the middle of the night and make your way toward the restroom, you're scooting along, trying to feel the wall. And then you're, you hit your leg on the edge of the bed, and your other leg on the edge of the dresser, then your toe on the suitcase. And you're trying to make your way toward a restroom you cannot see, and then you get into the restroom and there's no such thing as gradual light in hotel rooms, at least the hotel rooms we stay in. There's no gradual light. It's just like the level of fluorescent lights that kill insects when you turn on that bathroom light. So it goes from blindness to blindness again. But I was thinking about scooting along in a hotel room in that level of darkness, trying to make your way through a room like that toward where you're going. It honestly reminded me of how a lot of people will walk through life. We're trying to make our way through what it feels like is darkness that we're not familiar with. We're scooting by, trying to get there, barely making it, scooting along and never fully being able to see where we're going or what lies ahead. I feel like today though, this message is for people that feel like life has gotten mundane a little chaotic, the path isn't clear, you're trying to find purpose or peace or meaning in your life, and you just want the light to come on, to be able to see clearly and know why God put you on this earth for such a time as this. Jesus in John 12, 35 said this, Jesus answered, walk in the light, then you won't be caught walking blindly in the dark. Walk in the light. Jesus is talking about himself being the light. So I'm going to start off the message today by telling you where the message is going to end. But Jesus is the light. And if we walk with him, the darkness fades away. The obstacles are now clearly seen. And we have a clear objective in where we're going and where we need to head in life. Jesus says, walk in the light. So if you're taking notes today, again, uh, the title of my message and our header today are three questions everyone asks. And I'm just gonna tell you ahead of time today, this is one of those note-taking sermons. I, I've, this is one of those sub points, have sub points, and I've got some lists. Some of you guys like that, some of you don't, so I'm just going for it, it's fine. But I've got a lot of those little things, so if you wanna pull out your camera and take pictures on some of these practical lists, I would love for you to do that. But this is also one of those messages that we're tackling some big questions, and my hope today is that this can bring some answers, but really that this could spark a lot of your own study uh, study time in your own everyday uh, Bible study time in your life. So the first question is this, why am I alive? The question of existence. We're gonna start big and deep. Why am I alive? You guys have asked that, this before. I, I think all three questions we're gonna ask today at different times in life, whether we word them like this or not, we ask these questions. We just do. Why am I alive? Why are you alive? You don't have to answer out loud, but if somebody walked up to you today, you're eating lunch after church or wherever you're gonna go, and a stranger walks up to you and says, excuse me, do you know why you're alive? 
how would you answer? That, that's the tough one. I mean, that would catch me off guard. Well, why, why are we alive? Why did God take the time to make us? And there's also a times in our lives where we've asked that question in seasons of hardship, things are going wrong. I mean, it, it feels like bad news upon bad news. And there's also times in our lives where we've looked up to heaven and said, God, if this is what life was going to be like, why am I alive? Why did you take the time to even make me? And the great prophet Jeremiah even got to a day like that. In Jeremiah 20, 18, it says, why was I born? He's talking to God. Was it only to have trouble and sorrow to end my life in disgrace? There's times in our lives where we have those moments. God, why did you even take the time if this was what my life was going to be like? But I wanna say today, even beneath the seasons of life that are extremely difficult, in them and around them, there is a very specific purpose and destiny for your life. There's a reason we're alive, and God has a very big plan and hope for your life. There was a man named Dr. Hugh Moore at Northeastern University, and he once wrote to 250 well-known philosophers, scientists, writers, and intellectuals in the world and asked them this, what is the purpose of life? It was for the purpose of a study at his university. He began to get responses and then published a book. I was reading through a few of those responses, and honestly, the vast majority of them are pretty depressing. Because even the greatest philosophical minds, if you are not allowing yourself to be open to the idea of God, each reason that we can come up with that people are alive have a very distinct dead end at the end of those roads. Carl Jung said this, I don't know the meaning, the purpose of life, but it looks as if something were meant by it. Isaac Asimov said, as far as I can see, there is no purpose. Joseph Taylor said, I have no answers to the meaning of life, and I no longer want to search for any. The problem with a quote like these, or especially that last one, is a life without purpose isn't a life worth living. A life without purpose isn't a life worth living, and that might explain now why the second leading cause of death among teenagers is suicide. Because when God is no longer at the center of meaning in people's lives and we're trying to find meaning and purpose everywhere else besides God, what we end up finding ourselves in are dead ends that can't give us what they promised to give us at the beginning of that road. And God is saying he's the only one that can bring true intrinsic meaning into our lives. And without God in the equation, we really don't have very many good alternatives for the meaning of life. We can try several approaches though. The mystical approach basically says this, look within and find your purpose within. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't trust what's in there to tell me the ultimate meaning to why I'm here. This in here has led me astray many times. I don't trust within whatever that means. And if every person looks within for the purpose of life, then we're never in unison for any purpose and it only creates chaos. If we search from within and I'm the one who decides my purpose in life, that is a weight that human beings aren't meant to carry. And we begin to crumble with anxiety when we believe the mystical approach that it comes from within. The philosophical approach has a few different mentalities. The survivalist says the purpose of life is just to stay alive. There's not much meaning after this world to so just stay alive. And this also explains why some people have such an intense fear of death. Whether they acknowledge it or not, they have a philosophical survivalist approach. I have to survive at all costs. No risks in my life. I, I'm afraid of everything that comes at me because this life is all there is. And if, if this goes away, I don't know what else there is. The survivalist approach only views this life as all we have. The naturalist says the purpose of life is just to perpetuate itself, to perpetuate itself, just a biological response. The hedonist says the purpose of life is pleasure. This is one that's very popular today. I don't think people are necessarily walking around calling themselves hedonists, but we have a whole lot of people in the world today that view the purpose of life to be pleasure. 
sexual pleasure, sexual identity, you know, all, all, all kinds of different things. And all pleasure isn't sinful. But whether it's sinful or not, if we put pleasure on the throne as God, it will be a dead end. The materialist says the purpose of life is about the acquisition of things. The life is measured by the things we own. Again, people aren't walking around going, I'm philosophically a materialist. Nobody consciously says, if I gain everything in this world, I will be fully and finally satisfied with everything. We don't consciously say it or even believe it, but so many people subconsciously believe, if I get one more raise, if I get that one more title, that if I can just achieve that, break that amount of money in our savings, if I can just do this to set up our kids, and some of those things are great things. They're, some of these aren't even bad things, but when we make them ultimate, they're all bad things because none of them will bring you the true meaning and answer the question, why are you alive? All of those keep you searching for more. The Westminster Confession of Faith was written in the 17th century, and I think it has an amazing, very simple answer to this question, why am I alive? It says this, man's chief end is this, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. The, the purpose and meaning why we're alive is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. We get to enjoy God because God really does enjoy you and we are meant to glorify him. And when our lives are not glorifying God, then we're living outside of how the creator created his creation to be. And we know anything that we use in a way that was not intended by its creator only causes chaos and friction, right? So our lives are the exact same way. We are built to glorify God and to enjoy God. Isaiah 53 or 43, seven says, they are my own people and I created them to what? Bring me glory. Now, we, when some people re read that and they think, <clears throat> well, so God is just arrogant and he just wants glory. No, God is deserving of glory and we have an opportunity to show God to the world the glory of who he is to the world. We get an opportunity to show the world his glory and to glorify the God who's given us everything that we have. It's our response of worship to him. So how do we bring him glory? How do we bring him glory? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of illustrate it like this. Um, think about the last time you were with your family or a group of people, and you were leaving a restaurant, maybe on vacation, and somebody, somebody's always the social media person, and somebody goes, hey, we need to get a group picture. I always forget the picture. Anybody else the picture forgetter? Yeah? Who, how many of you guys are like the ones that never forget the picture? Okay, you people. Okay, so anyways, you're, you're leaving the restaurant, you're on vacation, somebody goes, hold on, we've gotta get a picture. We've gotta get a picture. And everybody goes, okay. <laughs> you know, they, they get over it. Nobody wants a picture. But then the person, you hand this random stranger walking on the sidewalk your phone, and then they're holding it up, and somebody over here, that's the social media person, goes, take 15, take 20. And the person's like, okay, and they barely know how to work your phone. And they start taking the pictures, and you're like, cheese, and all these different things. You're taking the pictures. I love watching these situations from a distance because the exact same thing happens in every situation right after that moment. The person takes the pictures and they go, okay, I think we're good, and here's what happens. Two or three of the social media people race to the phone. They race to the phone and go, hey, can I see that real quick? I just, I just wanna look at the picture, make sure it's good of all of us, right? And they don't mean that. They take the picture, they zoom in on them, and they go, how many chins do I have? How many wrinkles do I have? Are my roles showing? You know, all those kinds of things. That's what we do. And so we look at the picture because we wanna make sure, we wanna make sure before you put my image out there to the world, I wanna make sure you are imaging me correctly. You're imaging me correctly. Now, it's, God is not vain like us, but what he is saying is you will find purpose when you image me, God's saying, correctly to the world when you understand the calling of being made in God's image. Genesis 1, 26 through 27 says, then God said, let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, make man in our own image, according to our likeness. 
and let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, and over the entire earth. So God created man, us, in his own image and likeness. His own image and likeness. We have the personality traits of God on a sub-level. We have the kindness of God, the mercy of God. We have so many of the amazing traits of God within us. That's what the word likeness means. We are not God, but he loved us so much he wanted to give parts of himself, glimpses of himself into us when he made us. And we have the honor and privilege of imaging him correctly to the world. So the point to being created in God's image is that human beings are meant to display or reflect God to the world. I, I want you to think about it like a mirror. I'm going to try not to blind you. Is this bad? It's bad. Okay. I'm going to try not to blind you guys with this, but here's the image that I want you to think about when we image God or reflect God. What God is saying is, I want you to image me correctly. So when people look at you, what God's saying, I want them to look at me. When they look at you, I want them to go, the God that made them did a good job. There, there are pieces of his characteristics in them. He wants us to be a reflection that points back to him. So here's the image. It's almost as if we should live life with this image of holding a mirror up at a 45 degree angle. So if we were on the same level, I don't want to blind you, but if we were on the same level, if you looked into this mirror, the point is don't look at me, but if you look into the mirror, you're going to see the reflection going upward. It's this image of it's not about me. I can't be at the center of the universe to find meaning in my life. I will live my life saying, if you look at me, you're going to see the goodness of God. If you look at me, you're going to see glimpses. I can't be the whole thing for you, but I can be kind, but you can't even imagine his kindness. I can forgive you, but you can't even imagine his forgiveness. I can show you mercy, but wait until you taste his mercy. But the temptation is this. The temptation is, thanks. I worked hard on that. The temptation is this. The temptation is, but I, I still want people to look at me. How am I going to find my purpose in life if life can't be about me? So the temptation is not to reflect God, but to slowly in life say, I, I just, I want to think about me just a little bit. And then the reflection changes and the world now sees nothing, no reflection. And you see you and you want the whole world to see you. This is horrible. You want the whole world to see you. And the moment we turn the reflection from God to us is the moment we now are carrying the weight of carrying our own purpose and destiny. And we begin to crumble under the weight and it just expands anxiety and depression and hopelessness and sadness because this is how we were meant to live. Look at God. Look at God. We're meant to bring glory to God. How do we do it? I'm going to show you. This is one of the lists. Seven practical ways. They're just going to list up there, and I'm going to move to the next point quickly. So you might go, well, that's easy. Yeah, the reflection, but how do I do it? These are so simple. Like, I'm looking at these. I'm writing these going, is there anything deeper? But it's, no, this is it. This is how we can learn to glorify and enjoy God. We have to be honest with God. This can be anywhere from confession to God. It could be being honest with God in our feelings toward him from time to time. We've all been in seasons where we were just mad at God. I think God wants us to be real with him. God, I feel mad at you today. How did you let that happen? Relationships cannot be built unless they're built on honesty, right? Forgive others. One of the best ways we can reflect God is the forgiveness he's given us. Forgive others. Serve others. Trust God. Over and over and over in the Psalms, as King David is writing, a lot of the Psalms are about trusting God. One of the commentators said, do you want to know why I believe most of the Psalms, David is saying, I trust God, I trust God, I trust God. It's because deep down, he naturally doesn't. And he's having to, through discipline, remind himself, trust God, trust God. And the more we write it down, the more we say it, believe it, the more we will produce fruit in our lives, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all the other fruits of godliness in the word of God. Give thanks. The beginning of our prayers shouldn't be God, give me. It should be God, thank you for giving me. Giving thanks to God, laying the foundation of gratitude, and then continually praying. I believe, I believe the world would be a radically different place if every person who called themselves a Christian would just pray, 
five minutes a day. The vast majority of Christians in every statistic have no set aside time of prayer. They have good intentions of finding pockets of time through the day, and they don't. We cannot know a God we don't have relationship with. How do we glorify God? Seven quick, practical ways, and hopefully those help. The second question I want to ask today, so the first one is, why are we alive? And number two is, does my life matter? So yes, you're alive for a reason, and does that reason really matter? This is a question of significance. When we go through life, there's really three levels of life that we go through. And some of the levels we can get stuck in if we're not careful. The first level that we go through is the survival level. Many people are here um, at this level today around the world. It's where a lot of people are. And this is basically just survival mode. They're barely getting by. They're just existing and not really living. They're controlled by their circumstances. They put in their time at work just to live for the weekend. They're just in survival mode. I can't wait to retire, or I can't wait to just get out of college. I just can't wait to get out of work on Friday. I, I, just, I just gotta, I'm just making it through life. And let me tell you something, that is not the life described in John 10:10 10, 10, when Jesus said, the thief comes to rob you of life. I came to give you life in its fullness. Jesus came to give you the fullness of life. That doesn't mean riches necessarily. That doesn't mean materialism. It means the fullness of life, of knowing why I'm alive, purpose in my life, something that gets me out of bed every day that actually matters. We are not called to live in survival mode. The second level that a lot of people get stuck in is the success level. Now, I want to say this. I am not against success. What I am against and what the Bible is against is success becoming your God. Success being the thing that drives us more than God driving us. And I think sometimes we can make this a little bit of an idol. And I, I'm not saying, hey, I'm not saying pull back from being an entrepreneur. I'm not saying pull back from being a business leader. We need more of those in Christianity. We need more people that are driven in the church. We need that. But what I am saying is be careful to not ever let it become ultimate. Because when we strive for success at the level that we think it will absolutely and finally satisfy us, you will end up more empty when you get whatever you wanted to get than you were when you started the process to attain it. It's the truth. In the success level, by the world standards, maybe you've got what you need and maybe you've got it made. According to the world standards, by and large, looking around the entire world, we would can be considered having comfortable lives. We would be considered extremely wealthy. We have possessions. We have freedom. We have health. And again, according to the rest of the world, we're pretty successful. And where has that gotten, gotten us as America, as a society? More depressed, statistically. More anxiousness, more anxiousness, statistically. More hopelessness, because it just isn't a good God. It can be a good thing in your life. It just isn't a good God. Number three is this, this, the significance level. So you go from survival to success, but this is where God wants us to be. Using the survival, if that's the season we're in, but finding significance in it. The success, but finding significance in it. But not our definition of significance, God's. Matthew 6, Jesus said this, but first and most importantly, now, if Jesus is starting off a talk like that, I think everybody should listen. That's a very important first few words. But first and most importantly, seek the kingdom, his kingdom, and his righteousness, talking about God, his way of doing and being right, the attitude and character of God, and all these things will be given to you also. Everything that we strive for in life that God can approve of, He's saying, if we just put him first, there will be room for the other good things, but he, they just can't be God things. Because if they, in, if they fill up the God compartment, there is no longer room for God. But if God is first, everything we need and the godly desires of our hearts will be added to those. This is out of Jesus's mouth. And he's saying so many people have this upside down. 
We strive and we go make successful lives for ourselves. And then we go to God and go, God, are you proud? Look at what I built. Look at what I made. Can you bless it? And God's saying, I can't bless what I didn't call you to do. You didn't seek me first. If you would have sought me first, you would have had room for so much more. The significant level, but we have to seek him first. And what does it mean to seek him first? Because you're like, well, yeah, seek him first. But, but how does that like actually play out in life? How does it actually play out in life? I, I think really by prioritizing two things. And when Jesus says seek first the kingdom of God, really I think it's these two things. Number one, meaningful work. Jesus actually said out of his own mouth that when people couldn't find him, that he was about his father's business. Jesus worked with his hands. He worked with people. He worked his entire life. But it wasn't the fishing that brought significance. It's what he used the fishing for that brought significance. He was saying, look at this occupation, disciples, that you're doing. This occupation in itself is good, but when I redeem it, now it can be a mantra for all of time. You're gonna fish for men. You guys follow me with this? There is meaning in our work. So we have to find work that has eternal value and eternal meaning. Now, I know some of you guys are thinking, my job ain't it, you know, kind of thing. You know, not gonna find eternal value at Taco Bell. Not gonna, you know, whatever it might be, right? But here's the truth. It's not what you do. It's who you are and how you perceive what you do while you're there. Meaningful work is not a job title. It's what we do while we're there. I'll tell you this. Meaningful work is not pastor. It's not teacher. It's not lawyer. It's not business person. It's not whatever else it might be. That's not what, me, what gives this work meaning is what I do when I'm a pastor. How I see pastoring. How do you see teaching? What meaningful work are you asking God to reveal to you while you're teaching? What children can you make feel valued where they may not have that at home and they just sense in you that something's different? Whatever it might be, if we are not invested in meaningful work and only daily work in tasks, then we will only be making to-do lists rather than to-be lists. Meaningful work gives you something to be. Just doing gives you something to do. And how many people just all they do is go through the motions. They're just doing, working, 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 and never stepping back and going, where is the eternal value and where I'm spending my time and my work? What am I taking with me into eternity? If you want significance in your life, it's by sowing seeds into eternity in the present, in the present. So meaningful work, and then secondly on this part, meaningful community. We all need friends. We all need friends. I think friendship can be a great thing anywhere. But let me tell you, there's something special when there's a community of believers that are doing community right. There's something special about that, the meaningfulness of that community. There, I, I love, I hear stories all the time of someone in our church and they were diagnosed with cancer and they call their small group and within 10 minutes, the small group's at their house. They're not just posting on Facebook thoughts and prayers. They're there, storming the throne room of God, believing for a miracle, saying, does your family need food? What do you need? Do you, do you need someone? Do you need a vacation? Whatever it might be. I have seen this over and over and over again. The community of God, when we really step in and get into community, get into small groups, get into Alpha, get into these serve team groups, and we're in and we're serving, there is something special about that community that just feels eternal because it is. There are things you can, conversations you can have when a child walks away from God, when a marriage is suffering. I I've, I've, didn't tell this story in the first service, but I'll, I'll never forget hearing the story of my oldest daughter when she kind of went through a little bit of a tough time spiritually, like so many teenagers do. She was on a missions trip with a missions team when she began to confess just things in her life. And she came back to God on that trip. I wasn't there. My wife wasn't there. You know what never crossed my mind, I'm being honest, until someone asked me, someone said, well, what, do you, what all do you think she said when she was confessing sin? It never even crossed my mind. You wanna know why? 
because it was meaningful, eternal community that the Bible talks about. My daughter just confessed and opened up to people she trusted and it stayed there with people she loved. And now she's thriving and leading worship in our church because of meaningful community. We have to have meaningful work and meaningful community. Do you guys believe that today? Number three, third question, what is my purpose? What is my purpose? Number two is, does my life matter? Number three, what is my specific purpose? And I put a question of intention because I wanna know what's God's intention with me specifically? Well, I know generically with mankind, but why did God make Dustin Woodward? What's my purpose? What's your purpose? But here's what we do know. Ephesians 2.10 is written to all of us collectively and individually. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So there's so much loaded in this. You, this is not fluffy language. This is real language. God's saying, you are my masterpiece. You are not an accident. You're not broken. It doesn't matter what people have said to you, what you've been told, how you feel. You are God's masterpiece, and he has had something planned for you since long ago for you to do something special on this earth. And I know statements like this for some of us are easy to kind of just roll our eyes at and just go, you just don't know. I do know. I have actually been there. And let me tell you, this verse is one of those verses I have gone back to and gone back to, and I've read it and I've asked God, but do you mean this about me? Am I a masterpiece? Do you still look at me like this? I don't feel like a masterpiece. We don't feel like a masterpiece until we are uniquely finding what God has uniquely built us to do. And it's almost like a key perfectly fitting once we know and find out this is it. But we've got to put think time into it. We've got to put prayer into it. We've got to really get out the distractions and say, God, why am I here? What have you called me to do? Psalm 139, 13 through 16, I love this. In the Passion Translation, it says, you formed my innermost being, shaping my delicate inside and my intricate outside and wove them all together in my mother's womb. I thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. Everything you do is marvelously breathtaking. It simply amazes me to think about it, how thoroughly you know me, Lord. You even formed every bone in my body when you created me in the secret place. Carefully, skillfully, you shaped me from nothing to something. You know who you created me to be before I became me. Before I'd ever seen the light of day, the number of days you planned for me were already recorded in your book. This is how detailed God is, how specific God is, and this is why the enemy, one of the enemy's number one attacks is whispering in your ear the opposite of everything we just read. You are an accident. There is nothing special. There's nothing unique. You don't have talent. You don't have ability. There's no way God can use you. And Satan will even get other people to say those same things that he's saying in your ear. Why is there so much of that coming at us? Because we are attacked the most against what I believe are the most profound truths in scripture. And this is profound. You're his masterpiece and you were intricately made with a purpose. I'm gonna end with something very practical today. And I wanna end with five purpose revealing questions. And this will help you just practically because if you're like me, I would sit in a sermon like this and go, I, I, I believe you, I agree, but what do I do? How do I find this? And this, these are some things that helped me. The first question is, what lights a fire in me? What lights a fire in me? Passions and interests that I could do all day. Now, obviously, all of these were within the context of God and his kingdom, but still think through these. World issues that burden my heart. Messages I feel led to share with others. Second question is, what can I do very well without much effort? And don't be like, don't be self-deprecating right now. And be like, nothing. No, just, you can't. Don't do that. Think through it. What can you do very well without much effort? Can you write? 
Can you be creative? Can you play music? Can you speak? Can you think in depth about issues? What can you do very well without much effort? Natural strengths, natural abilities, special talents. Number three, what is unique about me? What is unique about me? Personality traits, values, or life principles. I think this is probably the most important one, your spiritual gifts. If you've never done a spiritual gift assessment, I, I think there's some amazing ones online that only take about 15 or 20 minutes to take, and they're not perfect for sure, but they definitely point you in the right direction to look at those gifts and look at what the Bible says about those spiritual gifts and how you're wired, because once you start finding out your spiritual gifts from the Holy Spirit, that's a whole different level of being purpose-filled and having fulfillment. When you are, are able to walk out the giftings of the Spirit in our own lives. Number four, what are my significant life experiences that prepared or inspired me to help others? Found meaning in the experience. Learned major life lessons. Maybe you had a horrific breakup. You went through a divorce, a death in the family, or a near-death experience. Maybe you had trouble with your teenagers for a while and they came back to God, or maybe you had trouble with your teenagers and they never came back to God. But these life experiences, this is one of the things I love about God the most, although he's not the one causing all the bad things to happen, he is the one who can redeem every bad thing. And I think it's always important for us in the healing process to say, God, I'm not blaming you for this, but I don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. When it's the appropriate time, can you light up the path for how you can redeem this? Who can I help in light of my circumstance? Who can I help in light of my story? And the moment we begin to help others with our story, God begins redeeming it, and now we become free of it, right? Um, number five, what God dreams are in my heart that won't fade. What God dreams. Notice I didn't say, just say dreams. God dreams. You could have a good dream, and it may not be ungodly, but it may not be a God dream. A God dream is something God has put inside of you and is this consistent and consecutive. You know that you know that you know this is God and it's not just a good idea. There is eternal value in this God dream. There is something that I can help impact society or a school or a workplace or a city with this God dream, okay? What kind of God dreams are in my heart that won't fade? Types of people or situations I usually help. Messages I feel led to share with others. A role or activity I keep imagining myself in. What God dream? And if you don't have a God dream, let me tell you something. It won't take long for you to get one once you ask for one. Once we are in right standing with Jesus and we go to God and we say, God, I want my life to matter. I want my life to have eternal meaning. Meaning, I don't want my life to die off with me. I want everything I leave to be sown into eternity, into my children, into my grandchildren, into my business, into whatever it might be. God, give me a God dream. It will not take very long for the whispering of the Holy Spirit to come into your mind and begin to give you a God dream because God wants your God dream to come alive he wants you to find your purpose. He is not hiding it from you, but he is ready and willing to reveal it to you when we simply ask. It's a God dream. But there's one key thing in all of this, and this is how I'll bring this to an ending today. It's not just about a generic God. It's not just about generic ideas. There is one way and one way only we can have true fulfillment in this life and for eternity. And Ephesians 1.11 gives us the answer. It's in Christ, it's in Christ that we find out who we really are and what we are really living for. I want that to sink in, just really let that sink in. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us and had designed us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and every one. We cannot find our life's purpose without Jesus. He's the way, 
He's the truth and he's the life. We're not talking about a generic God. We're talking about God the Father who sent his one and only son to be the way. I love Revelation 3.20. It's been a scripture I've held with me since I was a little boy. I'll never forget seeing this painting. We were visiting a family. Um, my, my parents and I were for dinner one night. We were walking down the hallway of their house and there was this big painting. I'm sure you've seen something like it, but big painting of Jesus and there's this door and it's beautiful. And Jesus is calmly standing outside this door and he's knocking on this door. And it's a reference to this passage in Revelation chapter three. It says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends, as friends. I love that. I remember as a little boy, when I received Christ as my savior at the end of a church service, this scripture was used. It said, Jesus is standing at everyone's heart door and he's knocking. And I was remembering that painting and used that visual of Jesus standing there. Because in a painting, he's not banging on the door. He's not shouting, let me in. It's just this calm, peaceful look on his face and he's holding up his hand to the door and it's a gentle knock because Jesus is a gentleman. He's not in the business of breaking down doors, but he is in the business of walking through open doors and making a new friend. That's what Jesus wants to do today. And there's another passage. He actually calls himself a door or a gate. And I love this. In John 10, 9, Jesus says, yes, I am the gate. And other translations say, I am the door. Those who come in through me will be saved and will find green pastures. You'll be saved and find green pastures. So what Jesus is telling us is this. Green pastures symbolize something very specific in scripture. Green pastures, we go all the way back to Psalm 23 when David is writing about the valley of the shadow of death and then green pastures, they mean fulfillment. Green pastures are a symbol for peace, sustenance, joy. It's the desires of our heart in that pasture. And what God repeatedly tells us in scripture is he desires for us to be in the pasture, not in the desert. We go through desert seasons, but Jesus is standing at the gate, at the door. He says, I am the door. And everything every human being has longed for, whether they're conscious of it or not, their entire lives, we are longing for a home. We're longing for a love that will last forever. And all of those things can only be found in Jesus. And Jesus is the door. And he's saying the pasture is right there. But so many people, where they stop, people that call themselves Christians, they're still standing at the gate. They're looking at Jesus and they're saying, Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. Man, you're doing a good job as the gate. I even believe you're the savior. I believe you're the savior, Jesus. And But they're just living at the gate because it's one thing to acknowledge something as true. It's a whole different thing to live as if it is true. Now I wanna ask you, has your Christianity, your level of Christianity stopped you at the gate? Or have you actually entered into the pasture with joy and fulfillment? It's not perfect for sure, but you have what you've been looking for. The longings of life are now fulfilled. If you would bow your heads and close your eyes today at both campuses, those watching online, wherever you're at today, I wanna be able to pray with you. And I really think these moments are unbelievably valuable. I don't know your story and why you came in here today or watching online or at our Maui campus. I don't know why you came in today, practically speaking, but I do know why, spiritually speaking, because the kindness of God, his mercy wanted you here. He wanted you to hear a story about himself from his word where he can give you purpose and meaning in your life. Where finally, after striving so hard in life and ending up empty, the green pasture can be right there. But it's only found through Jesus and what he did on the cross. Jesus went to the cross to die for our sins, to take the punishment, the penalty for our sins in which the Bible says we have. We've all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, and there's a penalty for that sin, and the penalty is death. Jesus, in his love, said, I am going to come and be the perfect sacrifice, go to the cross, 
and take on that punishment. So all we have to do is call on the name of Jesus, the book of Romans tells us, and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. And the very next line is, and you will be saved. And then Jesus says, there are the green pastures. So we, if we want true meaning and fulfillment in life, it's only found in Jesus. So again, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to receive Christ today, here and in Maui and watching online, wherever you're sitting today. If you're in the room, I'm not gonna have you stand or come forward, but you know this is your morning, this is your day. You're tired, you're exhausted, and you need to go all in with Jesus, and you need to get into that pasture. You need what I've been talking about today. If that's you and you would like to join in on this final prayer, just on the count of three, just right where you are, if you would go ahead and raise your hand in both locations. One, two, three. Just raise your hand right where they're at. I would love to know who I'm praying for. Thank you. Keep them up just for a second. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can put them right back down. I can't see everyone's hands watching, but most importantly, God sees them. And even more important than that, God sees your heart and your openness to receive what he wants for you today. So I'm gonna say a prayer, and I want you to make this prayer your own. This is just a prayer to receive Christ as Savior. It's the acknowledgement of sin, and it's the acknowledgement that he is the one who covered it, and he's our Savior and Lord. So make this prayer your own if you raised your hand today, and this can be the most special, life-changing moment that you've ever had in your entire life. Father, we thank you so much for every person that raised their hands. God, I pray for everyone. God, I, I pray that you see our hearts and our minds and our openness to you, Jesus, right now. Jesus, we acknowledge what you did on the cross. We acknowledge our sin. And so we acknowledge the need for what you did on the cross. And we're saying, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean. Wipe my slate clean in my life. Make me a brand new creation. Today, I repent of my sin. And Jesus, I need a savior. You're the only one who can make me new. But Jesus, I also invite you into my life to be Lord. I'm tired of being the Lord of my own life. Jesus, I'm saying my life is yours. I, I, I wanna walk into the green pasture. I want the fulfillment. I want the peace. I want you to take me by the hand and guide me into the life I have been striving for and wanting. Come into my life, Jesus. Cleanse me and make me new. Today's the day. Jesus, we thank you. We give today to you, and I pray a prayer of blessing over everyone here today. May we know more about why we're here, our purpose, and our destiny, and may we be about our Father's business. We thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said.